Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, Stockholm Forum on Security and Development 2016. This year's theme being Leave No One Behind, Building Resilience by 2030. My name is Judith Kiros, and I'll be the moderator uh, today and tomorrow. Um, I'd like to start by introducing you to the director of CIPRI, Dan Smith, who will say a few words before handing over the mic, or in this case, the chair, uh, to four other speakers, Margot Wallström, the Swedish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jan Eliasson, UN Deputy Secretary General, Isabella Levin, Swedish Minister for International Development, and lastly, Emilia Perez, Timor Leste's Special Envoy to the G7+. Thank you so much. Excellences of uh, different governments, different parts of the world, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, all gathered here with all protocols observed, I want to warm you, welcome you very, very warmly to the uh, Stockholm Forum on Security and Development. And in saying that, may I welcome also our four eminent panelists to come up so that I'm not standing here alone on the stage. Uh, the, the steps are around this side. Yep. And, and the... Amelia, I think, yeah. So with this all done, please find your, find your own seats. I am not uh, going to take any time at all here today. I just, there's just one or two quick things I want to say. This is actually CIPRI's 50th anniversary year. And the board of CIPRI took what I thought was a very wise and creative decision, especially helping me as a new director coming in only last September, that 2016 should be a year of reflection. It's very, very appropriate because we face enormous problems. We also, however, have, for example, with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and also with the SDGs, and I am confident with the forthcoming World Humanitarian Summit, we have also got some major achievements along the road. And every time you face either new challenges or register new achievements, think a little bit more about what you're going to do. So it's good that this is a year of reflection. It is a process of reflection of which, like it or not, you have all decided to be part. The forum is a place where people have come together. A number of organizations, our partner organizations, are responsible for creating the sessions which you will then take part in. And so we are hoping to learn a whole lot from you and from the process of reflection that happens in this forum of ideas. Uh, I now want to hand back to, uh, to Judith to then guide us through the rest of the, uh, this first session. And the only thing to say is that we need to be out of here, I'm afraid, at um, all too soon, at two o'clock, in order to move on to a, to a press conference. So, with those few words, I'd like to declare the forum is open. Uh, Judith, over to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, then, Margot Wallström, Swedish Minister um, of Foreign Affairs, if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you very much. I would indeed very much like to say a few words uh, to you, uh, Deputy Secretary General, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a privilege and an, an honor to welcome you all uh, on behalf of uh, CIPRIS uh, Director Dan Smith and also my colleague, Minister uh, Levin. Uh, welcome to Stockholm and to this uh, third uh, iteration of the uh, Stockholm Forum on uh, Security and Development. But, friends, uh, we meet at a time of uh, great unrest. Developments in Syria, Burundi, Sudan, Afghanistan and Europe, where some are investing in buying blankets and others are buying all the barbed wire, are symptoms of a world order that has failed in its main task, and that is to provide safety and security for all. Currently, 125 million people have been forced to leave their homes due to wars and natural disasters. And this is the equivalent of the, the 11th most populous nation on Earth. 
more than uh, 25 billion US dollars has been spent on life-saving humanitarian assistance. And while this amount is 12 times greater than 15 years ago, never before have levels of gener generosity been so insufficient. In 2015, global leaders committed to leaving no one behind. The 2030 Agenda is a pledge of solidarity between people, societies, and nations. Its promise lies in the recognition that peace, security, climate change, and development are closely interlinked. Unfortunately, many humanitarian appeals remain unanswered. Nevertheless, the solution to violence cannot be and is not humanitarian aid alone. The solutions must be political. Political problems require political solutions. And I would like to touch uh, shortly upon four key elements. First, addressing the root causes fueling conflicts. And the peace and state building commitments agreed upon by the international dialogue, which Minister Levine and uh, Minister Peters will speak about shortly, are aimed at making international development cooperation more effective, long-term, and inclusive in fragile and conflict-affected states. And as we move towards the humanitarian summit in Istanbul, I endorse those commitments wholeheartedly. My second point is about empowering women and girls, acting as feminists. 16 years since the adoption of UN Resolution um, 1325 on women, peace, and security, we can firmly state that the promotion of gender equality is not only a matter of women's rights, but more importantly, a matter of ensuring peace and security for all. My third point is about making conclusive, inclusive, and sustainable peace. Almost half of all peace agreements fail within five years, and fragile st states are the ones most likely to relapse into conflict. And this is partly the result of flawed peace processes. A successful peace process is not only a matter of reaching a ceasefire, it is also a matter of justice, education, health, reconciliation, and fair distribution of resources. No warlord can achieve this. A sustainable peace process lays the foundation for resilient institutions that promote economic, political, and social emancipation for all. Peace processes, therefore, need to be inherently inclusive, and nothing to be discussed about women without women. Sweden has therefore initiated a network of women peace mediators, and the goal is to support women peace builders wherever they are and increase women's effective participation in peace processes. I'm sure we have some of you um, in the audience here. And my fourth and last point is about stepping up efforts. States and international and regional organizations must focus resources and increase their cooperation in support of peaceful societies. I welcome the Secretary General's call to development banks and regional organizations to increase cooperation, improve livelihoods, and strengthen support to fragile and conflict-affected states. Fulfillment of the 2030 Agenda must be our main task. Ladies and gentlemen, over the next two days, you will be discussing the future of peacekeeping operations, how to ensure inclusive peace processes, the complexity of violence, sustainable cities, and much more. And I am sure that these discussions will uh, assist us in advancing sound policy and ensuring that no one is left behind. Thank you again, and a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much, Margot Wallström. Um, I'd like to hand over to Jan Eliasson, UN Deputy Secretary General. Thank you, Thank you very much to, for inviting me to this meeting. I feel very much at home here. 
As I said, I don't have to book hotel in this location. And uh, it's great to be here to give a few perspectives from the UN on the interrelated subjects of security and development. Uh, 2015 was indeed a, a year of broad and deep reflection for the UN and its member states. Uh, we examined the uh, peace building architecture. We uh, had a panel on review of peace operations. We had a global study on uh, the uh, uh, results of the Security Council 1325 on women. We uh, had a new resolution on youth, which we, I think will be a, a parallel to the 1325 for women. Uh, this on youth was, established, was uh, adopted by the Council in December, and I think it will be of great importance also for mobilizing young people, that we not only work with young for young people, but also with young people. And then we had the uh, framework in Sendai on, uh, on disaster risk reduction. We had the financing and development meeting in Addis, and of course the historic, I would say, New York meeting uh, on the sustainable development agenda. And finally, in December, climaxing with the government concluding the Paris Agreement. All these uh, agreements and process reviews are to be seen as a whole and as mutually reinforcing. A comprehensive uh, framework, a roadmap, a global ro roadmap is set for peace and human progress for years to come if we now live up to these these, these landmarks. These landmarks reflect that there can be, as we have said earlier at another meeting today, there can be no peace without development and no development without peace, and none of the above without respect of human rights and the rule of law. And that's why I would like to give particular attention to Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is dedicated to peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development about the access to justice for all and building effective, accountable institutions at all levels. And I recalled Swedish history, how important institutions were to build our own country. Um, a fundamental char characteristic of the SDGs is that they are universal. Uh, in contrast to the MDGs, where actually only one goal was universal, number eight, all these goals are universal, and they apply to all rich as well as poor. And in a way, I would say, we are all developing countries. We are all developing countries in a world which is so much in need of sustainable solutions and awareness of common responsibility and awareness of the need for global cooperation in a time when we are testing whether we will look inward or look outward. So um, it's clear that in today's turmoil and turbulence, achieving the goals will be a large degree depend on progress in conflict affected and fragile countries. And that's why I congratulate uh, the, uh, for the Stockholm Declaration today, which really makes the case of how intertwined these issues are, how much in the, we need to build in the prevention elements and post-conflict action. And also that we must not leave uh, anyone behind. Uh, and that we must first of all reach uh, the, those furthest behind. If we can't do this, I, I doubt that we can achieve our global objective for 2030. I once recall, I recall uh, you know, something a Swedish prime minister told me, it was told actually by another prime minister, it was Olof Palme who told me about Tage Lander, uh, the prime minister, legendary. Uh, and uh, he was asked once, how do you measure the quality of a society and Tage Lander was a very hands-on person. He said, it's very simple, it's very simple. You just look at how the, mo how the poorest, the most vulnerable, the most oppressed are treated. That's the quality test of a society and of a nation. And that I think we should keep in mind. Now, another observation is that while the number of armed conflicts has decreased for some years, it's now turning around. We see a new level of violence, and we see new conflicts uh, developing in many parts of the world. Casualties and the human toll has increased considerably. And uh, as we see all over the world, international humanitarian law is neglected, almost in a state of decay. We need to really be reminded of those, of the, what we have all signed on to. Now, several factors drive conflict, and that's why the CIPRI initiative of discussing security and development is so timely and important. There are so many factors that will influence uh, what 
and drives conflict, and by that drives the development and respect of human rights. You have exclusion, political exclusion, you have exploitation of ethnic and religious identities. People want to scare us into uh, dividing societies into us and them. Glaring inequalities between and inside nations. You have human rights abuses, corruption, poor management, absence of rule of law, unequal access to natural resources, lack of jobs, and weak institutions. Pretty long list. But that shows how important it is that we see the dynamics between these factors. And also, I, must, I should add, climate change is becoming a threat multiplier by adding pressure on natural resources, affecting people's livelihoods, and causing population movements after violent storms and devastating droughts and floods. If you look at the movement of refugees and migrants across the Sahel and from Africa now, you see this element growingly uh, relevant. And all over the world, we see that peace and security, development, human rights, and rule of law are intertwined. And therefore, they must be addressed together. It's like three pillars that we have to strengthen at the same time. Is one of them weak, the whole structure is weak. And that's the main message of the 2030 Agenda. Political and security actors, humanitarian, human rights, and development actors must work in parallel around the same challenges. And we all need to work more closely together. We should break down, in fact, we must break down the barriers between silos and work less vertically and much more horizontally in order to make a difference on the ground. And finally, we must focus much more on prevention. If I look back at the charter of the UN, which I always carry in the pocket, I don't think I need to prove it, but I should for, to make sure it's here. Saving succeeding generations from the scourge of war is a guiding objective of this charter. And prevention, of, prevention is a charter obligation. Charter obligation. It says in chapter one, take, we must take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace. Something for every Security Council member to know by heart, particularly the permanent five, I would say. And I'm also glad we have the Human Rights Upfront Initiative, which is an early warning system which starts to work. And this focus on prevention rather than on firefighting and late reactions also applies to climate change, economic and financial crisis, and natural disasters. So it's a case, it's a, I need see that I'm reminded of time, but I will just say that the case for prevention is easy to make. It's, uh, you save money, you save resources. Still, it's so difficult that we don't do more uh, at an earlier stage. And there are so many uh, obstacles. Some people think it's uh, intervention, interfer interference in internal affairs to uh, talk about prevention. Uh, we don't have the necessary resources. Uh, Oscar, uh, my friend from peace building here in the UN, will say that we have not given enough funding for neither prevention nor peace building. And then it's hard to see, uh, prove the fact that prevention is, is the right thing to do. Did you ever see a headline in the media? The disaster did not occur? It's not very often you see that. So we need to prepare ourselves for um, a much broader, much deeper uh, analysis of peace processes and link it to our work on development and human rights. That's how we can make real progress. And uh, I will end by simply saying that I think the combination of the meeting this morning uh, with the international dialogue and this meeting with CIPRI is a great sign of the growing awareness of how these areas are interdependent and that we will uh, enjoy very much not only a better analysis but also have a much more interesting time when we listen to people looking at the same problem from other perspectives. If we can have a cultural change of bringing together peace development and human rights is in our total analysis of creating better conditions in this world, I think we're all in better shape. And I think this day here in Stockholm will be part of this journey. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Jan Eliasson. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Isabella Levin, Minister for International Development in Sweden. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Um, the theme of uh, this year's forum is highly relevant. To build resilience by 2030 means not leaving anyone behind. Yet, we face ourselves in a time increasingly characterized by violence, terrorism, also the threats of climate change, 
and uh, the uh, mass migration that is uh, not uh, wanted because of, of uh, wars and conflicts. I am proud that Sweden has remained firm in its commitment to provide 1% of our gross national income to development cooperation and aid. But aid isn't enough to fight poverty. We know uh, now that we have 60 million people seeking refugee in the world because of war, persecution, and other forms of violence, the highest number in history. So wars and conflicts is now a major a cause of poverty and a major hindrance to development. Uh, we need to see the link between security and development. Extreme poverty is very much focused and concentrated in the fragile and conflict-affected countries. So indeed now almost half of the world's extreme poor live in conflict-affected countries. If this trend goes on, by 2030, we will not have realized the Agenda 2030 uh, with uh, the realization of the 17 SDGs, but we will have two-thirds of the extreme poor living in conflict-affected uh, countries and fragile states. So uh, it's very important that we work uh, in an integrated way. Also, it's very important to make uh, our aid programs conflict sensitive. And Sweden has recently uh, taken the decision uh, to instruct our uh, development cooperation agency, SIDA, to make sure that all our development cooperation is conflict sensitive. We also adopted a long-term development strategy for Syria. Um, where key components uh, is uh, that it should be long and predictable, but also flexible. 2015 was an important year for global governance with uh, worldwide agreements on disaster risk re reduction that was already mentioned by Deputy Secretary General, sustainable de development and climate change. But now we need to shift to implementation and this morning, uh, the International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building had a very productive meeting, which came out with um, the Stockholm Declaration uh, for uh, uh, avoiding fragility in the future. And uh, together with my fellow co-chair and colleagues of the International Dialogue, we uh, have committed uh, to uh, four areas. First, we have committed to redouble our efforts to implement the so-called New Deal on fragile states and focus our resources to address the root causes fueling conflict and fragility. Through local ownership, the New Deal is a mean to achieve concrete results in difficult environments, which includes strengthened gender approaches and active promotion of women's effective participation in peace building processes as well as the youth uh, participation. Secondly, the principles contained in the New Deal are key for fragile and conflict affected states to implement the Agenda 2030. The peace and state building goals enable effective governance and can build societal resilience in fragile situations, they are really a tool for uh, fulfilling the Agenda 2030. Thirdly, uh, we committed uh, development actors to provide smarter, more effective, more innovative, and more targeted development support in fragile and conflict-affected situations, especially, especially in protracted humanitarian crisis and to the G7 plus countries. Fourthly, we committed to strengthen partnerships between development banks, international, regional, and sub-regional organizations. We must forge broader, deeper, and more effective coalitions for peace and state building. And the international dialogue is a flexible and ready partner in this regard. The New Deal for Fragile States provides a good concept. If it didn't exist, we would have to invent it. The international dialogue is a unique platform for peace. With the renewed commitments, I remain certain that the international dialogue can continue to provide an effective platform for development cooperation in fragile and conflict-affected se settings. 
And uh, I'm also very pleased that we will continue this discussion here at the CIPRI Forum today and tomorrow, uh, which will, I'm certain, help us to really achieve the Agenda 2030, where the SDG 16 on peaceful societies is really uh, 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 the, what we need to, the foundation that we re need to lay in order to achieve any of the other goals. And also we need to address climate change, of course, because that is also very fundamental. But peace and security is uh, what is hindering uh, the development of so many countries and um, the lives of so many people in this world. And this is where we need to focus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Levine. And now to our final speaker, Emilia Perez, Timor Leste Special Envoy to the G7 Plus. Thank you very much, ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today, we live in a globalized world. What this means is that all of us and our countries, economies, development, and futures are more intertwined than at any time in human, in human history. We have seen how conflict in one part of the world can lead to a complex social challenges in other parts of the world. As people move in mass numbers, to find safety and security for their families and loved ones. There is much talk about solving the root causes of these challenges. And as we are finding out in many cases, the root cause is conflict, which leads to a breakdown in state institutions, which in turn leads to a breakdown in security, which in turn leads to poverty. One of the symptoms of this in the modern world is the mass movement of people fleeing such a situation. Whether this is the recent case of the Syrians coming to Europe, or earlier cases of mass movement across the African continent, of even massive internal displacement as we saw ourselves in my own country in Timor-Leste post-conflict, the results in terms of poverty, social chaos, and suffering are the same. The world has certainly woken up to this reality, as can be seen by the recent success of the Sustainable Development Goals, in particular, Goal 16, which highlights the fact that peace building and state building are central to achievement of our future development goals. But the challenge now is how to implement these. Through organizations like the G7 Plus and the International Dialogue, there is a mechanism to address some of the core issues around conflict, and that has been encap encapsulated in the New Deal, which I am sure many of you have heard of, of already. So one important piece of the work will be to, uh, to look at how to incorporate the New Deal into the implementation of SDGs. But many people mistakenly think when policymakers talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, this is something for governments, or aid donors, or international NGOs. But this is not the case. No one group can ensure success in terms of the SDGs. For any country to be successful in this regard will now require a coordinated approach across government, civil society, and donors as the size of challenge is so large and resources required so significant, it is beyond the scope of business as usual. But in order to achieve such an approach, there needs to be a level of consensus and agreement that, that, that are the very things lacking in conflict-affected countries. And that is why the New Deal proposes finding ways to address the root causes of conflict through inclusive dialogue and the strengthening of local institutions. Without an end to conflict, there can be no hope of reducing the poverty that we now see concentrated in conflict-affected countries. And that is why forums like the International Dialogue 
are so important in terms of ensuring that we are all able to meet our commitments under the SDGs. Like I said at the start, it is now evident that there are no longer isolated problems. The challenges we face today are truly global. A conflict in one part of the world will directly affect all other parts of the world. And this is why this forum and others like it will be critical in terms of not only finding solutions to end conflicts, but also in terms of how to help achieve the sustainable development goals in all our countries, countries be that rich or poor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers again. And before I let you leave, um, I'd like to uh, share some practical information with you all. Uh, the format of these sessions, the afternoon sessions and tomorrow's sessions, are a roundtable discussion during which you're all encouraged to participate and share your views and insights with each other. But please respect the moderators whose job it is to ensure that everyone gets to participate. Um, moreover, uh, I'd like to point out that we're on a very tight schedule, you may have noticed. Uh, there's only a short break between the sessions and the panel debate at 15.15, so ensure that you leave enough time to grab a cup of coffee and then enter the room so that the session isn't interrupted. Lastly, if you're going to the City Hall dinner uh, after... Uh, the final session, then please make yourselves known to the organizers and they'll ensure that you make it there on time. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the afternoon. <laughs>